Senate Government Operations on Tuesday, June 23rd. And um, I'm going to do one, one um, very quick, no, we'll wait until Senator Bray um, joins us. We have permission to vote on the two charter changes. So we'll just vote those at the end and send them off to the thing. Okay. So what we're looking at here committee is um, we've had a lot of uh, interesting testimony around the whole issue of law enforcement changes. And as you saw yesterday on the floor, S124 had just two, I believe, comments. One was from Senator Hardy about the people on the um, Criminal Justice Training Council. And the other one was from Senator Pearson, who was um, referring to a bill that was passed quite some time ago and that um, never, it, the two, the conference committee died. And I asked Betsy about that because I could not remember it at all. And I believe it was the one that would have transferred um, the registration, the certification and regulation, not the contents, but to OPR. And um, the Senate's position was that it should go to OPR and the House's position was that it should not. So I, I really don't think that we have, that that's relevant to our discussion right now because I don't think we have time to do that. If we wanna look at that um, issue again in the future, um, unless the committee has <clears throat> other thoughts and things that we can do that now, but I think in the next three days we can't. I agree. I think we ought to leave what we have in there alone. Yeah. Okay. You say we can't. You, I'm sorry. I got distracted. You were saying you, we shouldn't deal with the make it with the council. No, we no. shouldn't deal with tra transferring the. Um, certification and regulation to OPR at this point. Oh, okay, sorry, I, I got distracted. I thought you were talking about something Yeah, because I, I, we, we just don't have time to do that. Oh, that's so, nice. so what we're looking at now, committee, is um, uh, Betsy and I have kind of taken the comments that have been made all along to us and different, different issues and different comments and tried to put them into a, a draft piece of legislation that would be an amendment to S-124. And so what I'd like us to do is focus on that. And it's, if you go to today's documents and handouts, it's the second um, document called 2020 S-124 SGO Individual Members Amendment. Okay. Yeah, and it's dated yesterday at uh, 7.21 PM. Well, yes, that's so if and there is a slight change, um, but that hasn't been posted yet, but it's just a um, we, we can deal with this draft and then um, because I think there are some other changes that might come to us. So what I'm going to do, see if this makes sense, committee, if you think this makes sense. There are distinct amendments in here that deal with very distinct issues. And what I'd like to do, I think, is look at them one at a time in, and have people comment on each of them so that we don't have general, um, general testimony on the entire set of amendments, but that we, so that we can finish up each one as we go along. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. All right, so with that, um, the first instance of amendment is simply changing. Some of these I'll have Betsy walk through and some I will just, this one is very simple. It adds the executive director of racial equity to um, the training council. We have had a, um, a request from the commissioner of corrections to put him back on at the time we did this. I think that I don't know who was the commissioner at the time, if it was Andy Polito or Lisa, but they didn't seem to have an issue with this, but he has requested to be put back on because he said that 
uh, with 800 employees who are intimately involved with the whole justice system, they, he feels that they need to be have their voices heard. I'm fine with that. Allison? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, Anthony? yeah. I mean, I'm fine with that, but that increases the number and does the waiting thing differently again, you know? I, okay, I'm just going through these one at a time. Now okay. we'll have, there are some su other suggestions that we put other people on here. And um, I believe Sarah Robinson is with us. And uh, I believe she would like to comment on this, but I, I want to just throw this out there that I think that we should not be adding up who's on this side and who's on this side, because that makes it look like we are creating sides to this. And I don't believe that's true. There are some people who, some um, public members may be on here who are um, fully supportive of things that a law enforcement officer might want to see in here. And there are some who might not. There are some of the people on that are being appointed here from law enforcement are very creative and um, forward thinking. I, I don't say some, but all of them. So I don't want us to set up a, a situation where it looks like we're creating law enforcement versus everybody else. Does that make sense? So I think we should get the appropriate voices on here, regardless of the um, how the numbers add up. And I, I did just out of curiosity add up the numbers and they're almost equal. If you assume that the um, League of Cities and Towns would appoint a, a right. local police officer and that the, um, anyway, they came out to be around eight to nine or nine to seven, depending on how you laid them out. And I, I, I don't, I did it just out of my own curiosity, but I don't think we should go there. Comments from the committee? Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree. I think we took testimony for a long time on the composition of both of the things that we have in the bill. And I think that just to get a question on the floor as we were reporting the bill and having it change something is sort of, uh, it wouldn't allow us to fully consider that. So I, I think, again, what we have here is fine. Yeah. Allison? And, and we've added some really thoughtful sort of citizen members, uh, you know, the not only the VLCT, but we've got the uh, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services added. We have uh, our executive director of racial equity, and we have three public members who are not law enforcement officers. That that's new, and that's work we did. So I I, I actually think what we've done. I would uh, echo what Brian has said that I think we've done pretty good work. Okay. I, th I think um, we could do. I think we could have done better though, given what people and people helped us notice. I mean, having the executive director of racial equity on there is good, but it seems seems to be the only person of color, and it just seems like. I don't know, I don't want to say tokenism, but it just seems like given what's going on and the way people are feeling about oversight, it might make more sense to put more than one person of color on the, on the or one either of color or from the human rights point of view. Okay, so I- Not person I, of color necessarily. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into, I mean, Susanna happens to be a person of color, but we haven't right. appointed Susanna. We appointed the director, which- right may or may not, that's an ex officio position, not to, um, that's to represent the, um, our need for looking at systemic racism and to be involved in the training council. But I would like to hear from Sarah Robinson, just to, um, and I think we need to be somewhat aware that starting to add groups, and I don't know how to say this exactly, but we, we can't, we won't add every group that exists in the state. That sure. is true. So um, I would like to hear from Sarah and remembering that the purpose of the training council is to, um, is to have 
is to oversee the training and regulation of police officers. That's that's what the training council does. So, with that, Sarah, would you like to to um, give us your words of wisdom? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me today, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and I. Uh, I'm sitting here with my three-year-old coworker, so I apologize in advance for any background noise you might hear. <laughs> um, so I uh, very much appreciate all the work that the committee has done on um, the bill thus far, and very much appreciate um, all the good conversations that you have had um, in in the past months about the composition of the of the council. And we're thrilled to see the addition of the executive director of racial equity added to the draft. We think that that's an excellent addition. Um, I know that on the floor, another uh, senator may have mentioned adding a uh, adding a place for the executive director of the Vermont Network itself. I did notice that the draft includes the executive director or a staff member of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. One way that you may be able to expand that just slightly would be to modify that language and say, you know, a representative of victim services appointed by the executive director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. So it could very well be a staff member from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, but it could be more of a community-based representative as well. Um, and we would be very supportive of that language, but um, just very appreciative of all the work the committee has done this far and your willingness to um, to look at these last minute um, proposals. Committee, does that make sense to just change the wording on, it's on line, um, on the draft that I have, it is on line 12 on page well, two. Yeah, 12 and 13. I, right. I, I would be supportive of that. Okay, Brian. Yep. Yeah. And Anthony. Sure. Okay. All right. Great. Actually, I just have, I have a quick question. I'm looking at this draft 1.1, 1 .1, right? Yeah. And you said lines. Mind lines don't add up. What, what line did you say this is on? Page page two lines. Um, 12, Twelve and thirteen. Got it. I'm sorry. I'm really scattered today. I got it. Sorry about that. It's the heat, Anthony. I was it's just going to say. I hope it's the heat. <laughs> So, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, do we, do we want to consider um, the human rights, uh, the director of the human rights commission? I mean, I would, I don't know if people want to, but I would. I, I would too. I, I would agree either that or ACLU, one or the other. Um, because the other thing I was going to Anthony's concern, which I think is important one for us to, to, to weigh it, with the three public members, we could also include uh, if we wanted to further identify that the communities we would hope they would represent, uh, we could do that there. But I, I see I, what I, I wouldn't go there. I think that the three public members are appointed by the governor and, and the, the governor will be sensitive to right. I, I think that um and i know that very well that if we put that in there randy brock would oppose it because he right. has opposed that in the past when we start identifying communities right I, so I would, just, um, I would support that uh suggestion is that that we have the executive director of the human uh, rights commission uh and I don't know how people feel about the ACLU. That is also an option, but I, I no, think I don't think so. Human Rights Commission would be great. Yeah, I don't think ACLU, but that's just my personal because I don't think that they. Um, well, anyway, I, I their goal is to defend rights, not to to be um, right. involved in training of. Right. Okay, anyway, and that's whatever the, else. The only thing I do with uh, the executive director of the Human Rights Commission is I'd also make sure it said or designee because she actually oh, has yeah. staff, unlike Susanna. Susanna has no. So um, she, there could be somebody to. Um, 
we could do that do that to, for the yeah for Susanna's position is also put or designee just in case well, she doesn't, she doesn't sure. have anyone to designate it to she could she could designate the chair of the uh oh that's the yeah. panel uh, she could designate yeah yeah I was thinking of staff but you're right the, the, she could absolutely we're not ignoring you Betsy don't worry I, huh? I would I would add those <laughs> okay add that. Who's, I'm trying to figure out who is all with us here. Who's MS? Michael Sterling, I believe. Oh, okay. <laughs> it just says MS. Okay, got it. I think Betsy wanted to weigh in, Madam Chair. Okay, Betsy. Yeah. Hi, Betsy Anras, Legislative Council. Uh, just first on the designee issue, uh, each council member is already statutorily authorized pursuant to 20 VSA 2354C to designate in writing a person within their agency or association to attend meetings on, in their behalf. So I don't think you need to add designee anywhere. Great. Okay. Um, in regard to the executive director of the Human Rights Commission, I just wonder if you should take her testimony just because I wonder if it would, serving on the council would in any way cause a conflict with her duties at the Human Human Rights Commission. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but I just am raising it okay. as a potential thing to consider. Okay, we will take that testimony. I don't think Boar is with us, but I think Rob Appel, are you there? I thought he was, but maybe not. There's someone named Robert, so I assume that's who it was. That's me. That's me. I'll even show you what I look like today. Oh, another basketball shirt. No, no, I'm better today. I'm not good. Where? I don't see you. There I am. There he is. There I am. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, there certainly is a potential cut for conflict. The, the council is a state entity. And as you know, the Human Rights Commission does have jurisdiction regarding um, <clears throat> complaints brought forward by state employees. But I don't think the for conflict is insurmountable she could whoever the executive director is could certainly recuse herself from such matters or the designee I, I don't think it's insurmountable and I, I agree that you're probably better off naming a state agency than a private nonprofit if you want yep. that effective representative with the council okay so does anybody else want to weigh in on this it seems that what we've done is we've added the commissioner of corrections back in We've changed the language for the um, Crime Victims Center for Crime Victim Services and said that it should be uh, someone representing victims of crime appointed by the director of the Crime Victim Services, the center for, and added the Human Rights um, Commission director. Is that where we are, committee? I think yes. so, yes. That's fine. Okay. Anybody else out there want to comment? Um, Mark, Mike Sherling, um, anybody else out there want to comment on this? I do have one comment, Madam Chair. It's Mike Sherling. Um, yep. The I was speaking with my liaison at the governor's office, and it was observed that training is an executive function, and there was a concern that removing the governor's appointments to the council uh, is problematic. No, it doesn't remove them. Oh. It, it, it reduces them to one. I personally am very happy to have all three of those public members appointed by the governor. I think, that would, I, think I would be too. I never thought about it, but. Well, we, did, yeah. we discussed it a long time ago. I mean, mm -hmm. it was like, I feel like maybe even last session we mm -hmm. discussed this and I, I think we sort of wanted a, to make sure that there was sort of broad representation and that's why we added the Senate and the House with an appointee. Betsy Ann. Just to confirm, there is not a constitutional issue with having legislative appointments, no. but it's just a policy decision for you to make. I Personally, I'm, I'm happy to have all three of the public people appointed by the governor. I, Unfortunately, oftentimes when the speaker and the committee on committees are supposed to make appointments, they don't seem to get around to it for 
months and so there isn't anybody there anyway. Well, the, the improvement I think we made here was that these were to be public members with no relationship to right. law enforcement. And I, I have to say, I think that's a good change and we could charge the governor uh, to appoint the same with, with the same that with the same uh, stipulation. But I think, well, it, you know, as the language stands now for the governor's appointments, it shall have a broad representation of all aspects of law enforcement. And that is counterpoint to what we have, the no, amendment we made. No, no. Allison, I believe that if you look at the language, it says um, three members who shall not be law right. enforcement officers or have a da 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 da, da right. one of whom is appointed by the governor. So we just take out starting on line 17, we take out line 17, line 18, and just put, shall right. be appointed by the governor. Right. I, I'm, yeah. I'm happy keeping that language, but we worked on that and we right. a very clear choice to not have those three be reflected in the page page one language that was previously. The yes, language. but we're not talking about the previous language. Uh, I'm just, I just want to make sure that we don't I want to make no. Okay. Uh, I, have a, Is there, I have a question uh, when you when you have a set. Okay, just let's um, see if we can finish this up. Are we okay with changing, deleting lines 17 and 18 on page two and having all three public members with the caveat that they not be related to law enforcement? Yes. Appointed by the governor. Sure. Allison? I'm okay with that. Okay. I, I... Now, is your question related to the council? Yes. My question okay. is in number two. My question is in terms of the terms of years of office, uh, the terms of office. Uh, it says only that a member's term shall be three years, and yes. uh, it's repeatable how many times. I think that we don't want a group of people who are on forever. And uh, if it if we don't say the uh, you know we, do we want to consider they can serve up to three terms before they take a year off, or what uh, what what's your thought on that? Because actually, I think that's an important issue. Well, the only fresh. people the only people who would be affected by that are the three public members because everybody else is an ex officio. So it, if they're and that changes by virtue of the administration or or thereby they're there by virtue of their office. So the um, the director of the executive director of the sheriff's and state's attorney's office, if that person is there for twenty years in that position, that is the that person is going to be on the council for 20 years because it's an ex officio. So right. you can't tell. I don't, I, I don't know. What do you think committee? I don't, I think this is fine, but. Okay. I think it's okay. Me too. Okay. Oh boy, somebody's objecting. <laughs> Who was that objecting, Betsy Ann? Was it you? <laughs> oh, oh, it's Brian. Ryan, I want to see him get up on your chest and hug you. Okay. Okay. So do we need to um, make, if we do this, do we need to change the um, quorum? Yes, because we've affected it by adding two people. I don't think okay. the quorum is specified there. Oh, sorry. Oh. The sheriff is, I didn't mean to speak over you, Sheriff. Uh, no problem. Madam Chair, may I address the quorum? Yeah. Uh, under 2354, it uh, establishes that the council can adopt rules to identify a quorum. So it's a council okay. that, and I think that that would be uh, an order of business that the council would address. Okay. Okay, so we don't need to address it. All right, so are we all okay with the first instance of amendment? Anybody else out there have anything they would like to um, throw in? Betsy Ann? I just see the executive director of the Human Rights Commission is with us. Oh, oh she great. is. Okay. So, uh, director, we have just added you to the, <laughs> um, uh, mem to the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. 
what is your um, pleasure or displeasure with that? Yeah, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Senator White. And I'm sorry for being late as I was trying to testify in a different committee. Um, well, thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> I, I'm glad I was able to be here. I, I want to say that uh, I definitely uh, support um, individuals being on this council who have knowledge and expertise in the areas of bias and race and discrimination. And so I certainly support that. But I always say it doesn't necessarily have to be us. It doesn't necessarily have to be the Human Rights Commission. Um, I'm, we're happy to do it, uh, but um, at the same time, we are incredibly busy. And oftentimes what I find is that I am most useful when I can volunteer, when people have questions um, and I can show up. I also have to be honest and transparent and share that when I heard that the Human Rights Commission was an entity that was being considered, um, my, I had a knee jerk reaction to that also because we are an enforcement entity. Right. And uh, law enforcement is a, place of public accommodation, roads are places of public accommodations. We do um, investigate police action and it potentially presents uh, a problem. I'm not saying that it is, I'm not saying that it is a conflict, but it's just something I'm always mindful of. Uh, one of the great things that the legislature did last year to support us was give us a director of policy education outreach position. And so I do think that that is someone who is removed from investigations and litigation at the Human Rights Commission. And so the potential exists that could be someone who could serve on the council, on the training council, and because they have no, uh, really no um, input or say in the investigations that go on. And so, uh, but that was sort of my initial reaction. And also I support the idea of people with knowledge and experience and expertise in bias and discrimination being on the council. I just think we are happy to make room for someone else as well. Um, and one of the things that could happen is one of those three appointees from the governor, you could add language that says, the governor shall appoint people who have knowledge and expertise and experience in those areas. And what, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Instead of putting the Human Rights Commission on there. And, and, I, and I really think that um, I would like to let the governor just appoint three people, but instead of putting the Human Rights Commission director or designee on here, why don't we put um, that someone, the Human Rights Commission will, um, appoint somebody with a background in um that does perfect. that make and then that you could perfect that appointment could be your policy director it could be or someone else joe schmo from wherever that's wonderful I, thank you what a great okay. idea okay she, she is full you, of them. she is full of great ideas she is, she is from how would how so she's from minnesota <laughs> what's that you we're, two we're both, Minnesota girls. Oh. Yeah. Four and I are both from Minnesota. Nice. Uh, which how is would, why I can't stand this heat. <laughs> me too. Me too. Okay. How Let's would you end. like to describe the background of the appointee? Uh, with uh, someone with um, a background in bias and implicit. Or, uh, how, well, how, um, or will yeah. you tell her? Or I, I think even just. Uh, an appointee from the Vermont Human Rights Commission. That's something okay, we would be the, thinking yeah. about. Yeah, Just, okay. I don't think we need that language. That's gonna be very obvious. That's our okay. mission and our goal, so yeah. You think you you would appoint somebody who had that background? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, yes. so an appointee by the, by the Human Rights Commission, not yes. from the Human Rights, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, right. committee, are we done with the, the makeup of the training council. All right. Yep. So our first amendment is done. Thank you, Betsy Ann. So the second one 
um, came to us, I believe, um, I, I'm thinking it came uh, by way of uh, Sheriff Anderson, but I can't be entirely sure here. But in the judiciary um, bill that we passed this morning, if you saw that, um, a, an agency will not be eligible for grants and from the state or the federal government unless they comply with the data collection. So what this does is adds um, that they would not be they would also not be eligible to send a recruit to the academy unless they comply with the um, data collecting um, uh, as it, the, and I'm not sure that this is the right reference, but it would be to the data collecting and um, up comply with the uh, policies required either by the council or by statute. So this gets, and it, and if you were doing something like, I, I think this is a, a way of telling agencies that they had better, um, they better start complying. And um, you make this far enough out in advance. I think that Betsy has it as 2023. And then the uh, council would set up the, enforcement procedures. So what do you think, committee? I like it. I, I think this will have more teeth, actually, even than the grants. OK. And um, Mark, if I spoke out of turn, maybe it wasn't you, but I thought it was. So thank you, Sheriff Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll give credit where credit is due. I believe it was Commissioner Sherling uh, who suggested okay. Uh, I would like to, looking at the proposed language for 2359, uh, it appears that this language is geared towards the basic initial entry. Um, I would also encourage considering in-service training. If we have somebody who's certified in the state who then says, I'm not gonna comply with anything and I'm okay with not having grants, we could be stuck with them for 20 years and that's not good for, for the law enforcement community. So uh, if a person fails to complete their in-service training for a year, then they, they'll essentially be removed from office by failing to comply. Well, this is just for the agency itself. Uh, That's the end. The sheriff is right. I, it is structured right now for just sending recruits to basic training, which is just right. the initial training to get certified. It doesn't address okay. the uh, annual in-service service. training to remain certified. So if, if the committee wanted, I could uh, revise it so it applies to any, the basic and the annual and service training. Uh, I make that. Um, Mark? Uh, I would propose uh, something to the effect of saying that an agency that's not in compliance cannot utilize the services of the academy until they uh, ascertain compliance. All right. Commissioner Sherling, are you with us? I am, and uh, I concur. It's not, it's not an event, though. Okay. Good. So are we okay with that, uh, Betsy Ann? Just a quick question. Did you want a future effective date in this? I'm realizing this does not currently have a future effective date. Well, I don't know that we need to actually, when I look at it, because the line 18 and 19 says the council shall adopt procedures, and I would assume that one of those procedures would be when it takes effect. Am Probably I wrong? It would be better to uh, specify because A is okay. a statutory prohibition, but I could say on and after XYZ date, if you wanted it to be, I think you said January 1, 2023. I, I don't know. Let's ask the commissioner when it would be a good date. Uh, January of 23. Three would be fine. Uh, I'm doing some math in my head. I, we could, you could accelerate it a, a, a bit. Um, I mean, okay. the reality is for, for race data in particular, this is, these are items that should be reported already. Right. So 22, would you entertain the concept of January of 22? Yes. Yeah, that's a year and a half away. 
Got it. All right. All right. Anybody else care to comment on the second instance of amendment here? I, may I ask a clarifying question? I, I am forgetting what the, the degree to which uh, agencies are non compliant. Uh, do we, uh, can you just remind me, whoever knows, uh, how many agents, you know, what percent of agencies are not compliant? How big a problem um, is that? I, I, I think that, that I'm going to speak up here. I think that would be a hard uh, thing to quantify because this says um, they also have to be compliant with policies required under the council's guide, um, that are mandated by the council or by statute. So some agencies might be compliant except for one model policy that they haven't adopted yet. So um, I, I think that would be very hard to, to uh, quantify. Maybe that's why we never heard testimony to that. Um, Mr. Chair Anderson. Uh, Madam Chair, I guess just a, a question of clarification. Uh, while I 100% agree with uh, this statute change and the language I proposed, uh, I also would like to hope that the council is empowered with the, uh, I guess, the ability to create procedures around waivers. Uh, for example, if a, we're aware, let's say a constable uh, says, well, they haven't been able to track this in a, a computer format and they need six months to be able to computerize their data, it would give them the council the ability to say, we understand you're making a change, but you come into compliance and allow that to be part of the, the procedures as uh, allowed in section two. I'm not sure we even need to say that here because it does say they should adopt procedures to enforce. But Betsy Ann? I was actually thinking about is specifying waiver authority. It, it might just help to, if, if okay. there's questions about it now, um, probably would be helpful to just make it explicit, just so there's no okay. question that the council could do a waiver. Do you want to do that committee? Madam yep. Chair? Okay. Fine. I keep pointing to committee members and I realize that you can't see who I'm pointing to. So, Brian? Yeah, I think just a prepositional clause, maybe including a uh, waiver authority, something like that would work. Okay. Anthony. That sounds good. Okay. So now are we done with number two? Yes. Okay. So this third one is, um, the statewide policy on the use of body cams. And um, today in judiciary, we did uh, require the, or on the floor, we required Vermont state troopers to use body cams by a particular date. Um, this would require, and there was a, a model policy adopted by uh, in 2016, I think it was an act that was passed in 2016. And this would now say that by January, 2022, if a, um, that they have to um, adopt this policy for the use of body cams. Any comments from anybody, Betsy Ann? And thank you to Gail. She posted that model policy from the LEAB. It's on your webpage if you do want to review it. Mm -hmm. And if you if you look um, later on under the the kind of fifth amendment, the fifth there is um, some language in there about the any changes that might need to be made to the policy, including. Um, some decisions about when when an officer can turn them off, when um, the footage is available, and to whom and how it um, might be redacted. And that is so. That's in the that's in the instance of fifth instance of amendment under those kind of review um, groups. 
So, uh, Commissioner. I'm not entirely following where you're at. Well, we're on the third instance of amendment here. It, it would just require law enforcement agencies to um, adopt the model policy by January of 2022 on the use of body cams. It goes beyond what we did in judiciary was just the Vermont State Police. Understood. And the uh, state police already have the model mm -hmm. and uh, the, we're in the final stages of uh, negotiation for the purchase. Um, I, I mean, I don't see any reason why agencies can't adopt the model. It doesn't get to um, the purchase component, but I see that in section, I guess it's not a, yeah, it is section 10A, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere buried down in there is uh, an exploration of a, a larger purchase initiative. So I, I don't have right. any issues with uh, adopting um, the model. Uh, I, I guess I would, my only observation is we continue to work on model policies rather than universal policies and for certain and i don't know that body cams necessarily need universal but i perhaps they do uh for other things i think a universal statewide policy is is different than a model framework yeah. to work for so i would hope that when we get when we get to the places where we might be using the terms model policy and we should be using universal policy that you would help us make those changes because I think you're right. And it, it may be just a little too early uh, to do that. So this is a this is a good incremental step. Okay. All right. Allison. Uh, Michael, uh, do you have a notion of how many agencies actually have and use body cameras other than the VSP? I do not. Uh, Mark, do you? Uh, total agencies, I do not. I believe there's three sheriffs, including my agency, who use them. And in my county, uh, two agencies who use body cameras. And the remaining agencies, most of them have in-car cameras uh, that also have a body microphone. Uh, but I can't speak uh, in totality. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So is the third instance of amendment, does anybody else have a comment they would like to make on, on this one? Um, Madam Chair, this is uh, Gwen Zaka from VLCT. Okay. Hi, Gwen. Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Warm. Yes, a little. Um, I just wanted to flag here um, that I, there's been some concern um, from a lot of communities who have um, expressed that um, sort of the understanding or um, uh, uh, outlines to how agencies should deal with video recordings and retention and release and redaction of sort of that information and having, um, you know, not very well um, established guidance to go from has been a real um, uh, issue for um, agencies or towns or cities that want to move forward with. Um, use of body cameras, but feel really uncomfortable not knowing um, the parameters around um, explicitly when, um, uh, you know, how to basically comply with the, the model policy that's, you know, been out there since 2016, but really hasn't been looked at since. Um, so I think, you know, there's a general support for this, but I think there, it needs to dial a little bit deeper and, you know, things, something so simple as, you know, the Secretary of State's office looking at how long, um, you know, records should be kept and um, what the retention periods are would be, you know, one thing. The other would be, you know, you know, the interplay between, you know, public records and what's uh, put forth in the LEAB's model policy. 
and making sure they sort of, you know, work together appropriately. Um, I just am flagging that because it's been brought to my attention from several communities who have police departments who want to use body cameras, but are really um, nervous. And that's been one issue or those issues have been brought up as being a reason for not moving forward with them beyond just the cost of, you know, the cost that goes along with it. It's um, also just making sure that they're in compliance with, um, you know, records and uh, records retentions and public uh, records requests. So, Gwen, if you go to page nine of the proposed bill, there's um, uh, starting on line six, there is um, a further review of it. And I think that um, mainly it talks about um, any changes that might need to be made, the um, request for uh, responding to public records requests and looking at the possibility of uh, group buying. But I think that we could also add something about length of retention and um, data collections, data storage. Does that would that, be very helpful. Does that yes. help? Yeah. OK. Yes, because I, I, yeah, particularly the, the retention periods, that's, yeah. that's um, also that's very helpful. OK. All right. Anybody else have a comment on this section? Madam Chair, may I? Yes, please. Uh, with regards to uh, Section B, uh, the Council yep. should incorporate the provisions of this section into basic and annual and service training. I'd just like to request the removal of the word annual so that we don't have other uh, valuable trainings pushed out to say, turn on your camera. Um, I think there's value to cameras. We have used them for many years. Uh, but there's also a point where you can just keep repeating the same words. Okay. Yep. Got it. Any issues with that committee? That would be on line 10 on page three. I mean, four. Anybody else have a comment on this amendment? All right. Hearing none. Can we move on to the fourth? So this one um, doesn't really make a change until page six. Page, the other pages are in here just to put it in context, I believe, but it makes the change on page six. And Betsy, do you wanna explain this one? Sure. So this was going to the issue of having more uh, public member oversight of complaints that come to the council. Um, and this actually somewhat relates to, at least in part to what Senator Pearson was bringing up about just some outside review of complaints that the council received. So in this section, in subsection A, it provides when an agency has to report to the council um, in regard to alleged unprofessional conduct committed by an officer of that agency. And you can see, for example, at the bottom of page five that as part of their report, the agency has to provide a uh, to the council a copy of any relevant documents associated with its report, including findings, decisions, and the investigative report because the agencies investigate these allegations for the most part. And so this suggestion on page six is to add um, specific language to say that the council advisory committee would be provided with these documents when alleged unprofessional conduct is reported to the council. And then the have that council advisory committee recommend any appropriate action to take in regard to a law enforcement officer who's a subject of that report. Uh, just to remind, the Council Advisory Committee was established when you added the unprofessional conduct chapter. It's in 20 VSA 2410, and its general description of its duties is to specifically advise and assist the Council in developing procedures to ensure that allegations of unprofessional conduct are fully and fairly investigated and that appropriate actions taken. It's made up of five individuals that are appointed by the governor. Four of them are public members that don't have a law enforcement connection, and one is a retired law enforcement officer. Any um, comments on this from, um, I'd like to hear some comments from um, the commissioner, from, uh, I guess, um, Sheriff Anderson is with us. I think Chris, um, Chief Brickell is also with us. 
and um, maybe Julio. This was trying to give a little more teeth to the review and a little more outside review. So I'd Madam like Chair, to hear. Yes. The commissioner is time, li time limited till two. So if you'd like to have him speak first. Oh yes, please do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I can stay a couple minutes past two. Uh, I, I actually would defer on this topic to uh, to Chief Brickell, who's got more uh, a greater wealth of more recent experience with council operations than I do. Okay, thank you. And if you have to leave, um, we're happy that you were here with us for a while, and um, we'll make sure that you are heard on the other issues also. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Brickell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can I also defer to Sheriff Anderson for about two minutes while I take care of the situation here, and then I'll be right back. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Sheriff. Uh, Madam Chair, can I defer to Chief Brickell? I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but you could, why don't you defer to Senator Collimore because he really is the brains behind this. <laughs> I, I do trust that that's the case, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, one thought I have, uh, I've been kicking around the thought around accountability and uh, it seems that the premise of the accountability became important when the council became the, uh, the authority for decertification. That's when it started to the OPR rules and responsibilities, which then shifted from a representative council of the professional organizations to both a uh, representation of professional organizations and an oversight uh, need, which I think is what has caused the evolution of this. So my thought is, uh, and I'm I'm spitballing here a bit, but why not have the the council report to the uh, committee on government operations annually, saying these are the complaints we've received, and report to the legislature. Well, I think that this. The, this was not just um, reporting, this was actually allowing the Council Advisory Committee to um, have some input into the decisions that were made. Right, uh, and, and make recommendations for action. To... I guess my second question is, and I'll admit my ignorance, who is the Council Advisory Committee? I'm not sure if Betsy had mentioned that, I had something else happen that caught my attention. Betsy Sure, it's in uh, 24, section 2410 of the Council's Unprofessional Conduct subchapter. I did look on the Council website and I, I saw that they were accepting applications for the Council Advisory Committee. I, I don't know if it exists in practice yet. So Betsy, is the idea that this Council is actually gonna do an investigation? Or do they just get the report? I'm no, because with it. under the unprofessional conduct subchapter, it's really the agencies themselves that investigate allegations of unprofessional conduct, and then they report what the uh, final results results of their investigation are to the council. And then how it was set up to work is that the council reviews that information and then uh, determines whether charges should be brought. So it's based on the investigation of the agency itself. This advisory committee was set up to help support the council in its duties in regard to unprofessional conduct, um, but it's advisory only. It does not, it specifically does not have any decision-making authority. And I believe what the, what this would do is give them not decision-making authority necessarily, but some more, a, a few more teeth by um, asking them to recommend appropriate action if needed. So they might recommend that somebody gets suspended or something like that, they have that kind of power? Okay. So it kind of acts as a citizen, more right, as that's a citizen a, that's review board. Trying, That's kind of what I'm wondering, because we had talked about citizen review boards the other day, but we haven't, we haven't talked about them since. I'm just wondering where that whole thing is at. Madam Chair, I'm I'm back whenever you're ready. Okay, I think this is where this, and then there is a um, another a section under the review thing, which is on um, page eight, 
that asks us to look more at uh, citizen review boards. But uh, this is so, uh, Chief. So again, you're correct that when uh, when there is unprofessional conduct, the matter is investigated, and then it is brought before the council for a myriad of different types of actions. The council advisory committee was um, was created, although to the best of my knowledge, is not in place in practice yet. There has never been um, contact between the council and a council advisory committee. This proposed legislation would certainly make um, exact common sense for exactly the, the reasons that the Council Advisory Committee was created so that they can actually hear the information that's provided to the Council and then offer a different perspective of what would be um, a good recommendation to the Council when they're looking at the certification of an officer based on the allegations and the investigation that takes place. I don't think that there's anything that the Council would look at as that being detrimental to their deliberations on how to handle certification of an officer that's coming before them. You you were breaking up there a bit. I hope Betsy got more of that. Um, you did. I heard the it chief is, say it makes sense. <laughs> it's it to does. summarize, to paraphrase. Yeah, that's what I thought. It does, it does make sense. It gives the council an additional, uh, aside from oversight, but more input from another body outside of the council to look at what is the proper sanction that should be going against an offer certification based on the facts presented to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on this particular one? Okay. All right. So now we're on number five already. So the fifth one here, and I, I will say um, the first four were things that I thought and Betsy thought that we could, we could actually do because we had enough information on them that we could make a decision and um, put in there as real action items to pass into statute. The fifth Amend the fifth one here is a whole lot of um, we need more work on this, and we're not in a position to make this final decisions at this point. If over the next couple of days, if any of these seem that we can make decisions, then we can add make um, separate amendments for those. But at this point, what I'd like to do, I guess, is um, look at each of these. I think there are um, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different um, studies or reviews here and start with um, number one and start looking at them and see if, if, if there is something that we can do right now, then we can change it from a review to doing something. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. I feel I must say something um, on that page, the, beginning with the Fifth Amendment, lines 12 through 16. Um, I, I guess I just don't agree with it. And I'd rather see it struck. I don't remember agreeing that the further goal of defining law enforcement not as warriors. Um, I think that's a little strong. And I also just would mention nothing I've seen, whether it came from us or the Judiciary Committee, indicated any support for our law enforcement community. Um, even if it was just a sentence or two that, and I don't know how we want to say it, but you know, the great majority of folks who work in that profession are great people and work hard and that kind of thing. Everything seems to be, and forgive me if I'm misreading it, but everything in my view seems to sort of be going the other way and, and has sort of a, maybe not a punitive piece to it, but anyway, I, this one, I, it, it just struck me as, as being um, something that I, I didn't want. 
So I, I will take responsibility for that. Um, when we heard, um, and it wasn't, they weren't terms that, first of all, I am, I am sorry that you feel that um, we are somehow um, overall kind of criticizing and putting down law enforcement because I don't, I don't feel that way. I feel that, that we have worked with law enforcement and many of these suggestions came from law enforcement. So I think that we, that they, law enforcement themselves, except for some rogue officers out there, I think are interested in making sure that people, that they have the respect and trust of their communities. And, and I think that for the most part in Vermont, that is true. Um, the way, the, where these terms came from was actually, um, there was a 21st century policing report that came out, but then there was also, when we heard from Drew Bloom in judiciary, um, he, he testified to us, he's a, um, use of force instructor and he testified at great length and in very articulately about um, teaching use of force and, and how it really is de-escalation is the first, the first option and the use of force is really the last. And um, he, he was the one that um, put, planted this in my brain. So Drew, if you're there, I'm gonna blame you that he, he said that the way law enforcement thinks of itself is as community guardians and not, and that over the past, um, there has been too much of a warrior, warrior um, approach in many instances. And in fact, that was one of the um, comments, I think there were like 25 comments in the Bennington um, report that came out and that was one. That was one of them. That, and so um, do we could, if it if it's better, just uh, by defining to further the goal of defining law enforcement officers as community guardians, and and just leave out the the warrior part because that maybe does sound incendiary, and I did not mean that at all. And, and I didn't necessarily. I, I didn't mean to imply that at all, Madam Chair. I just. It just struck, it just hit me and like whoa wait a minute, warrior means they're they're sort of an antagonistic sort of, of engagement right off the bat with the general public and I've never had that experience. I know other people have and I understand that and I understand that we're trying our best to work through solutions so that everybody's treated the same way. But I would agree if we could take that small phrase out, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm fine doing that. Other Thank people. You. Sure. So well, that we're just redefining, we're, we're continuing defining and defining law enforcement as community, community guardians. That, okay. That'd be great. Thank you. You are welcome. So let's look at the, um, the, the start with number one here. And I don't know that the appropriate people are involved in each of these, but this would be looking at, Betsy, why don't you, um, it's best if you walk us through this because you can do it more succinctly than I. I don't know about that, but I will try. Um, so this is, starts out by saying that the following entities, because there's a whole list of them um, and topics that they'll, uh, provide a report back to the GovOps committees in regard to their progress on the following topics, including any recommendations for legislative action at the beginning of next January. And I, I think that you know they could continue to review these issues and maybe the General Assembly would ask them to. So then how it works is that each um, numbers one through however many they are just separate these um, separate the topics. And so the first one is in regard to law enforcement officer qualifications. And then as you'll see, it's set up, it names different entities that may be the correct ones to address each of these topics. So the first one in regard to law enforcement officer qualifications uh, requires the LEAB to recommend 
statewide standards for interviewing and hiring new officers in order to recognize applicant qualities that are desirable and those that are not, and to specifically recommend standards that should apply to officers in a supervisory role. And I believe this came from uh, the commissioner when he talked to us. Um, Allison. So I'm curious that the commissioner isn't using his his is encouraging us to use uniform as a language in, in, in embedded in our work. So statewide for me would be a uniform standard uh, for this for all of these things uh, as opposed well, to a statewide standard. He's not encouraging us to do that because he's not with us anymore, I believe. And so this is one of the places that we could find out if it makes more sense to say yeah. universal. I'm yeah, still here. Oh, you are still here. Oh, good. Uh, Michael, I, I think that this is, is this maybe one of those places. Place to start that. Uh, I do think it's it's one of those places where, uh, you know, standard uh, standard batteries of questions can be used um, and standard process to assess the same things. We're looking for largely the same things. There may be some community nuances that individual communities want to add to the mix of mm -hmm. their hiring process, but by and large, we're, we know the bulk of what we're looking for. Do we want to add there that um, community nuances are, or do we just, take that for granted here i think you take it for granted okay yeah i like the way it's written now okay well, all right i'm oh, sorry was there a suggestion to substitute universal standards yeah. for statewide standards for statewide yeah i think that's what michael was saying what michael is that what you're saying Yes, I think uh, having a, a statewide template for hiring um, makes sense. So statewide, not universal. I'm trying to. I'm sorry. The, the, I, I'm not sure that there's operationally much distinction there uh, if you're looking for the right yeah. language. It, I think it's your choice. Right. I'm, I'm just trying to support your work to moving things to uniform standards and uniform implicate Im, implementation and you know uniform policy all right we'll change that to universe universal standards so um b so first of all is everybody okay with a what i'd like to do is um try and figure out as we go along so that we don't go through all of them and then come back so does anybody have any comments on A? I, I do Rob? Yes. Yeah, and I, I, I could former Chief Sherling with this. Um, I would suggest using, uh, uh, recommending the use of citizen hiring panels so that there is citizen input into selection of new officers. It worked well in Burlington is my memory. Mike, you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I, I concur. And, and it's in uh, the, the 10 um, area strategy draft. And, and I interpreted this to give the latitude um, within statewide standards for interviewing and hiring to allow for that. And while I have the floor, let me offer one more comment, which is this is um, the fifth proposal of amendment is session law only, correct? It's not codified. If people are interested in finding this and they're not finding it in Title 20, it's gonna be hard. Just a thought. And I, I know you're not final on what the form's gonna look like. I see Betsy Ann shaking her head, but it'd be nice to have it in the green book once, once you get to an end product. Thank you. <laughs> Another discussion. Thank you. I disagree from a, just a plain up drafting perspective, because this is just temporary language. It, the okay. law is the law. Um, just from ledge council perspective, we don't put uh, these types of temporary right. reports back in statute. Of course, the countervailing interest is public accessibility and transparency. Another debate for another we will count. <laughs> we will count on the advocacy groups out there to make sure that the public is aware of these and responds to them and that if 
when the reports come back, if there are suggestions for legislative change, then they would be in the statutes. Thank you. Okay, so, so B. So, so, so sorry, just to finish on A, are we going to include uh, a subsection there asking for the use of citizen hiring panels? It's already there. Where? According to what Commissioner Shirley just said, it, okay. it encompasses the same with the phrases that are used that they're going to recommend statewide standards, et cetera. And in, or, in, or, in order to do that, they will consult with citizens. Okay, I think that's what he said. That it's in process, but not done yet. Correct. We're assuming they're going to consult with citizens. I mean, there's no requirement. No, I'll yield back to the commission. I thought that's what he said. That's correct. I think it's it's worded uh, it's in a sufficiently broad way to allow not only to, to adapt interview questions, but to recommend a variety of things that we've at least initially drafted for exploration in the, in the plan. Okay. Okay. So B. All right, page seven, line three, this would require the council to consult with the Human Rights Commission, ACLU and other relevant organizations in reviewing the current law enforcement recruit written, oral, and psychological examinations for cultural sensitivities and appropriateness. Comments? Rob? Uh, line four, I would suggest adding other relevant organizations and individuals. You may want to be able to consult with an individual psychologist or um, somebody else with expertise who may not be a member of an organization. Yeah, and I, my guess is that they'll consult with lots of different people, but we wanted to make sure that certain groups were actually specified, but I think that's a good idea. Any other comments from anybody? And just so that everybody knows, I can't see, I can only see nine people here. So if you have something and you can't raise your hand, I can't see you just holler out, but okay. Senator Colomore? Thank you. And Betsy, forgive me, you are an expert at drafting, okay, and I'm not. But when I read that sentence, when I read it the first time, I thought, well, there must be a mistake. It should say recruitment. But in, re so line five, in reviewing the current law enforcement recruit written oral. So the written oral and psychological modify the word examinations, right? Yes, and so recruit is the pronoun for the recruits or the people that go through the academy to become certified as law enforcement officers. So it's the, the recruit exams, but I could fix it up. I see what you're saying. Might be um, maybe say the law enforcement written oral and psychological examinations for recruits or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. that's Thank what you. I was thinking. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks so much. much better. Thank you. Yeah. You may want a quick suggestion. You may want to have it more broad than that because sometimes we're hiring laterally and they're not recruits that are going to the academy. They're just new hires and they have, they're subject to those testing standards as well. So it's really just anyone we're hiring. Okay, maybe applicant, would app that would be a good substitute? Sure, uh, and maybe Chief Brickell, if he's still on, might have a, a, a more nuanced modifier as well. I, I am still on and no, I, I think applicant serves right because you're you're right. I mean, there are we have out of state candidates coming into the state and people that are re, uh, just moving laterally. So I think that that makes sense if you just leave it as applicant that applies to anyone. Okay. This is Thank a, you. from the police academy yep. as well. An applicant is uh, what we use to for a general term, so it's right in line. Good. Thank you. Allison? So um, I get cultural sensitivities, but appropriateness is not qualified. And I'm just curious what kind of appropriate, I mean, there's a, a whole range of appropriate. Uh, uh, I'm just curious what we're wanting to capture with that and if we should qualify it in some fashion. Well, I, I don't care if we have, 
I, I don't know what that meant. I put it in there yeah. and um, and I, I was thinking of things like um, the example that we were given about the uh, new American who wanted to become a law enforcement officer and in the written exam, there are five, there's a scenario and then there's five different responses and you choose the best response. But right. since English wasn't his first language, the, the, the English is such a bizarre language that um, it, it, some of the differences of the nuances in words are right. so um, small that he couldn't choose, he knew what the right response was, but he couldn't correlate it to the written language. So I just think it's, uh, what I meant was any kind of appropriateness to recruiting people anything that was instead of trying to um, do a whole long list of things. So if, if that, if they're better uh, language, then let's, let's do it. Yeah. I don't know why that isn't a sensitivity, uh, I, I guess. So I, I, I have a suggestion, which would be incorporate the, the ability to serve as a community guardian or some language along that line. Well, this is, okay. It's a suggestion. Could you say that again, Robert? I'm not sure I understood what you meant. Well, above, uh, we're talking about community guardians. That's, that's right. the goal of law enforcement officers as stated by the legislative body. So, you know, psychological examinations to determine whether the applicant has cultural sensitivities that would allow and the appropriateness to serve in that capacity to discharge the role of a community guardian. Right, I, I, th I think that would be helpful. All right, um, Commissioner, are you still with us or Chief? I'm still here. Did you... Um, have a comment on that or a different way of expressing this? No, uh, again, I, I think there's there's enough latitude to to be able to bring back uh, a variety of of options. Yeah, but but I think that's right because that's what we're looking for community guardians, and it is whether they would be appropriate as a community guardian. I think. I well, think I think that. I think that that is covered actually in the in a looking for the the um, qualities that are desirable and those that aren't desirable. I think that that's where we get here. This is looking for the actual um, written and oral and psychological examinations that are given. And here's um, here's an example, and maybe this is a really dumb example, but. When my daughter was little, she uh, seemed to, uh, well, anyway, it doesn't make any difference, but we took her to be tested and um, they showed her a bunch of pictures and then she was supposed to identify what they were. And there was this one picture of a kind of an oblong thing like that with something in the middle and then it had these little lines on the top and it was clearly a hot dog. And um, she said, I don't know what that is. And there were a couple things like that that she simply couldn't identify because she had never had a hot dog at that point in her life. So the exams themselves have to be designed in a way that um, acknowledge the, the cult cultural differences and, um, and other, other differences, not just cultural differences, I guess, but um, rural versus urban, are there differences there the way people perceive um, exams? Um, I, I don't know, but I think that um, this isn't just looking for qualities. This is actually asking them to review the exams themselves to make sure that they are appropriate. Um, I, Brian? Uh, no, I, I think you've hit it on the head, Madam Chair. I would suggest changing that phrasing on line six. Psychological examinations for cultural sensitivities and appreciation for cultural differences. Which goes to your point, if, if you don't understand 
the other person's orientation, you might be asking what you think is a very legitimate question when it completely doesn't mean that to the person. So you have to appreciate that there's differences. It's just a thought. Okay, and, but, could I, but I do want to make I like sure it. that we're not just talking here about cultural differences and cultural sensitivities, but the appropriateness of the exams um, for, for anybody, for somebody with a limited vocabulary, which may not be a cultural difference. Right. Uh, so wide, I just want to... For a wide range of applicants is what you're trying to get at, isn't it? I, I, want, I want the, the and I know that they're doing this already. I know that the, uh, they are reviewing the, the exams and the, both the written, oral, and psychological exams. I mean, the commissioner talked to us about, should they be using the MMPI? Maybe not, maybe they should be oh. using a different, a different tool. Um, and they are looking at that already. So I just wanna make sure that, um, we're reflecting what they're already doing and making sure that it isn't just cultural sensitivities. And I, I'm not sure how I get this across, but anyway. Oh, Betsy Ann maybe has an idea. I just want to say sure overall appropriateness. Yes, okay. Look at that, she came up with it. I know. Okay. Anybody else have any comment on that section? No. Okay, so we have finished the law enforcement qualifi officer qualifications section. Betsy Ann, do you want to lead us to the training section? Yeah, next topic is training. And so first off, I'm on page seven, line eight, that the council in consultation with the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel. ACLU and other relevant stakeholders shall review current requirements for basic and annual in-service training to determine whether appropriate training provided in areas of cultural awareness, implicit bias, de-escalation and mental health conditions, and whether that training is embedded into training on other policies like traffic stops and searches. And then I think that, um, B is so related to that that I think we should go through B and C before commenting on them. Sounds good. So under B, after they would conduct that analysis um, and they would review the officer's current training requirements and how that training is used in practice, the council would then recommend any amendments to statutorily required training that might not be necessary for all officers. And I think, for example, one, one suggestion was whether search and rescue training is appropriate for all officers, for example. It is currently statutorily required. And then um, top of page eight does get into uh, the academy itself. And yeah, you want to get let's, into that? No, let's look, let's do, let's look at these, um, the number one first. A and uh, I B. Mean a, a and B. Where am I? I lost my pages, yeah. A and B. Any comments I'm fine on with this? It. Rob? I'm looking at line uh, 13 on page seven, implicit bias, de-escalation, and mental health conditions. I recommend that that language be expanded to be recognition of and responding appropriately to mental health conditions. It's a big issue in the field. Recognition yeah. of mental health conditions? And responding appropriate, appropriately there to something like that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Madam Chair, this is Cindy Taylor Patch from the Police Academy. If I could have just a second. Please do. So I just wanted to um, bring it to folks' attention that we had asked for the expansion of basic training to uh, expand our efforts and what we're already doing on all these topics and, and provide even more training on that. Um, unfortunately, the 
the funding for that uh, mid pairs has been withdrawn uh, due to current state budget issues. But just wanted to know that there has been a lot of work um, mm -hmm. prior to all the current events and asking for an expansion of all those topics. Thank you. That's um, and and we acknowledge that a lot of what's in here is already ongoing by the whole um, law enforcement community along with other communities. So I think yes. that we aren't we aren't inventing anything here that isn't already being considered by most people. We just want to reinforce it and make sure that it's um, that we uh, what was it that um, Senator Colomore likes to say? Not a boost. It was good. It was good. It was good. Like a kick in the butt, but not that isn't what you said. You said something really nice about just gentle reminders. Gentle, gentle reminders. Maybe that was nudge. Yeah. Was it nudge? Nudge. Very good. Nudge. nudge. Good. Okay. Well, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot more sympathy. Uh, in, in the in in the what we've been going through as a nation and as a state, I think there's going to be a lot more sympathy for spending that money at the academy now. Actually, so this is an important nudge, I would say. Yes, I appreciate that, and I I don't take any of this in any way negatively. I actually appreciate no. the conversation, and it's it's helpful on my end to help uh, get everybody on the same page and moving in the same direction. So thank you. So if I may, any I'd, other I'd comments? Like thank, I'd like to thank Cindy for her work on this issue over the last several decades. She's been great. <laughs> really provided great leadership of the Academy on this. Thank you, Cindy. Good. Thank you, Robert. So uh, any more comments on number two A and B? Okay. Let's go to C. All right, so C is about just how training is provided in general. Uh, in general, so this would require the council, LEAB, Department of Public Safety, uh, to consult with BLCT and other interested stakeholders to determine uh, whether the police academy should be re relocated to a different area of the state, and whether there should be more flexibility in the residential and field training required of recruits including whether recruits should be able to uh, satisfy some of those training requirements through an internship with outside entities, such as a mental health agency. Um, then I'll just note that- and Betsy, Yeah. Yeah, this is where your uh, the addition is. Yeah, draft 1.2, the only difference between the two drafts is that draft 1.2 would also ask those parties to consider whether the council should be reestablished within a state agency or other oversight entity. And Gail has that posted now. And um, okay. if you pull up draft 1.2, it's just on that new language is on page eight, line four and five. And that's the only difference between the two drafts. Uh, comments, yeah, Allison. So we, we had quite a good conversation, productive conversation about um, uh, work study, uh, incorporating more work and internships and uh, experience into their training um and uh, you know mental calling out one area is is okay uh, i also thought one of the important conversations we had was the division the difference between an urban a very intense urban experience in in community in, in policing in community guardianship uh and rural you know and i think that's a that's a, a, a an area too. And um, if we're going to talk about increasing cultural awareness, it's also an opportunity for international, uh, you know, a, Cana a period of uh, interning with the Canadians uh, on one of their or in England, where they use very different community guardianship techniques. Uh, you know, it strikes me that they're, you know, calling out a couple other areas to give people an idea. If this is just session law, we can do that. And um, I, I think any and all experience people get in this training that broadens their their experience is is valuable. 
So I, I, I agree with you and I'm not sure how to word that so that it's clear we could just um, end after inter internship and leave it at that and um, hope that, I mean, we could just do that because we don't want to, yeah. you're right, we don't want to define just one area where, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Cindy, if Cindy's still on this call, I would hope that that would be taken back to the academy because we're really we had a very good robust conversation about this, and you know one of the you know they people who've gone on who've been exchange students or AFS students or you know have who have lived in another country all have heightened sensitivities to differences in a way that you know kids who've just had experience in America you know don't necessarily have and so I think all these options that we could be exploring and they're great granting opportunities too uh and they're they're you know anyway i think that's right yep just rich with opportunity if i may yep. madam chair it's mike Sherling. Uh, perhaps yes, just mike. substituting experiential learning for internship gives it a broader oh. context yeah that would help good yeah and that gives opens yep. up the door for imagination. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Okay. This is a little this is a little tiny thing, but are we gonna keep the words with outside entities? Make it clear. No, that it's just put basic no, just training through experiential learning, period. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay, anybody else have any comments on C? All right. And this if goes not, back. Let's go. Yeah. So it's great. And are we doing pilot? Had we talked about doing pilots with this or are we just moving no, forward? No, I, I don't think we're in the, at the point of doing pilots with yeah. this. Okay, C, I mean three. Yeah, and I'm going to keep referring to draft 1.1 because I think that's what the committee members yeah. have up. So I'm yeah. on page eight, line 10. Topic three is the regional civilian review boards. This was one of the suggestions. I believe the AG's office had provided some testimony on this. Um, so this would require the AG's office to consult with the council, the Human Rights Commission, and other interested parties to recommend the manner in which regional civilian review boards could be appointed to oversee the discipline imposed on officers by their agency or the council or both and the recommended powers and duties of such a board. So one group, it would be given Curtis, Curtis Reed is very supportive of this. I mean, there were a number of people who were very supportive of this, but um, uh, Curtis's organization would be a, 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 another one, I think, to call out here or what, any additional. I I'm not sure I would, um, because there are not numerous, um, Curtis, there are, there are three organizations in Brattleboro and just itself. And if we called out just one, I think by saying other interested parties, okay. um, they, they would be covered, but I would hate to start, um, listing some organizations and leaving others out. I mean, the human rights commission, and then when, where we, um, referenced ACLU, they're kind of a different level of organization. They're pretty much statewide, but if we, um, that's yeah. just my feeling. I don't know committee people, how you feel. I think that's good. I, I'm sorry, I sort of hadn't focused that you had another interesting parties. I was just focused on where our discussion of the idea. Anybody else have comments on, on three? Uh, this is uh, Gwen Zaka from VLCT. Uh huh. Um, okay, we are, we understand that the interested parties might include us, but I think that um, calling out the league in this is actually really important, even more so probably 
probably than the preceding section and subsection yeah. two because we already have a seat on the LEAB. But for regional um, you know, review boards, I mean, I think the vast majority beyond uh, the sheriff's departments, these are going to impact um, the local constable agencies um, and then the uh, municipal agencies. So I think having a voice to how this actually works in terms of employment law and union contracts and those sorts of things um, is really important. So I think being called out would be, we would really appreciate that. Yep. Anybody else? I heard Julio, I think I heard you trying to chime in. Yeah, I had a couple of comments on three. In terms of who would fall within interested parties, I mean, both the league and I think the, the organizations in Battleboro, I think if our office were to remain involved in this, we obviously would talk to them in a lot more. I think we, right. we would also recommend community fora to, and uh, you know, virtually uh, all sorts of outreach. So. Um, I, I guess my comment really here is, that, my comment really is about three, uh, maybe a little bit about four, is that the models that are up for consideration, I think might be unduly constraining on the community and uh, the, the council, the HRC, and I guess our office. I, I testified last week that there are numerous different models of civilian review, only one of which is a civilian review board, and even with um, and and there are many days I can think of Denver, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle. Um, uh, let's others that come to mind. Denver, um, uh, I think I, I mentioned. Uh, yeah. We have overlapping models where they have a civilian monitor. Uh, it's a centralized monitor that does certain things, and then they have review a civilian oversight or review board that does other things. And I think that at least based, and I've missed testimony today because I was over listening to uh, testimony on, on roughly the same subjects is that I, I wouldn't want to, by legislative mandate, limit different models for consideration. Uh, rather, I mean, regional civilian review boards uh, has a certain sense, but there may be other models that when people do the research and talk there's a lot that's written about the subject. There have been books that have been written about it for the last 20 years. There's a national organization, the Civilian and Law Enforcement, I mentioned last week, NACOL. And I just would like the language to be loosened up a little bit so that those tasked with making recommendations aren't boxed in by the phrase regional civilian. It could include that, but it also uh, have other um, uh, recommendations and the scope of the uh, oversight might not just be limited to overseeing discipline imposed. There may be civilian input that's desirable about uh, investigations or indeed in some models uh, or high involved in investigations. So I think, I think the parties that are tasked with this should just have a little more freedom to do the research and get uh, community input on, on different models. So if you, um, if you, online eleven and other interested parties and i would put the lct in here on this one um to review different models for community involvement i think i think the phrase that comes to mind and i, I didn't uh, i i only got this within the last 20 minutes or so i think the you know um the, the phrasing that you see often in, in the trade is uh models models of civilian oversight yeah okay Includes right. civilian review boards and monitors and inspectors general and ombudsman, et cetera. And so, we don't have to name them. We can just right. say. Right, right. I was just saying it encompasses all of that when you say civilian oversight. Right. And so, so that's all. It's just one very short sentence then. Well, or. And, I, and, and, and I would not include it regional because that'll be part of the consideration, but it right. might be statewide as well. Okay. Um, so. It sure. could be titled something else, like model citizen review no, oversight. I think he all he already suggested the what it would be called. Right. Did Julio, you you had a term? Um, yeah, it was. I, so I mean, it might be improvising here. Uh, other interested parties to recommend. Uh, I would say one or more models of civilian oversight of law enforcement. Yeah. And I would right. to review, I would I say would review and recommend. Else you have here. Yeah. But uh, Mark, Madam Chair, my, my point was 
the title of the number three, I would get rid of regional there and, and just call it models civilian. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Sorry. Okay. That's all I Mark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Would this be a good time to uh, make my proposal for a pilot program? Well, I don't know that it even needs to be in here. I mean, I we have talked about it, but um, because we wouldn't be getting putting any money into it, I, I mean, you can make your proposal here, and we'll see if it if we need to put it in or if you can just do it on your own. I'm happy to do it on my own, and if nothing else, for the committee to be aware. Uh, after hearing some of the testimony, uh, both between this committee and judiciary over the last several weeks, uh, within my agency, and I believe I don't require any law to do this, uh, but within my agency, we've begun building, or I should say within my uh, county, we've begun building a civilian, but I, we don't have the name yet. I called it the Sheriff's uh, Advisory Council, um, and that might change at some point. But what it is, uh, is a combination of the assistant judges uh, the high bailiff, uh, who ultimately would be the person, or the person I say uh, is responsible for my coup as the sheriff. Uh, Can I just throw something out here before Mark continues? Mark was the high bailiff, and when he got appointed as the sheriff, we had to get a new high bailiff because he obviously couldn't arrest himself. I actually, uh, that's an interesting point, Madam Chair. Under Vermont law, I do not see any conflict of office with the high bailiff and the sheriff. So I would like to just know that we should probably fix that. But I did resign my position as high bailiff out of just the moral ethics. Uh, so the high bailiff followed by uh, a member from uh, uh, a person with a town experience, a person with uh, education experience, uh, and then uh, uh, a familiar face for, for many of you, uh, Eton. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his last name from RDAP. Um, so that's the at least the initial panel that I've uh, I've convened uh, with the intention of that panel growing it to a size roughly double uh, of its uh, comp uh, makeup uh, to provide for uh, both advice to me as a sheriff as a sheriff I have no board no council no commission nobody really that uh, provides me oversight or uh, response similar to a select board. Uh, which a chief of police would. So it's hard for me to be able to have a sounding board when it comes to policy development. But then the pivot as part of these conversations about having oversight and civilian uh, intervention uh, was to uh, potentially pivot this group to say, how do we bring people of a variety of diverse backgrounds in to be able to do this? So within my agency, I can certainly do that autonomously. Uh, but if an interest in trying to develop a model on a regional level, uh, was of interest to this committee, I would offer what we're creating as a, a potential Petri dish to start that. Thank you. And for your information, I've been uh, corresponding with uh, CSG around um, expanding, not just the citizen review model um, part of it, but Kind of how do we deal with law enforcement in general and perhaps a pilot um but i i don't know that we need to put that in here um i i think that it, um it what do you think committee my my fear is that if we put that in here that other areas are going to say well we need to have our that what we're working on in here also I, I just, um, I fear that this would bring more comment than necessary. What do you think? I agree. Yeah, I agree with you. Allison, you're very quiet. As oh. usual. I, I always <laughs> love to move ahead with pilots, but I think I'm worried that it would go back to a probes. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think we're fine where we are. We always have next Jan January or August for us to come back and uh, do further work if we if we want to move something further along. But I think for right now, given our time, let's let's start with this. And, and I would say that if as you move forward with this pilot and you find out that you need statutory changes to allow you to do anything, then that's that's where it would come in. 
Yeah, and, and I would say, Mark, okay. your your pilot may be a model for us to look at as we look at how to expand it and roll it out. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree, uh, Senator Clarkson, and uh, if nothing else for your awareness, but to offer this, at least for my agency, I think it's a good uh, forward step for us uh, regardless. I don't see any need for funding right now. I don't see any need for uh, any uh, legislative change. Uh, and if I do find that out within the next couple months, then I'll probably be back in August to, to talk to you yeah. about it. Okay, all right. So we're done with three. We've made those changes. Four. All right, page eight, line 17. This is about reporting unprofessional conduct or alleged unprofessional conduct. Um, so right now, council is a place where people can report unprofessional conduct, but this, um, this section would require the AG's office to consult with the Council, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and other interested parties to identify a central po uh, point for reporting allegations of officer misconduct, which could be the Council or another entity, and how those allegations should be handled. Comments on this? I think that there were suggestions that at uh, different places that it could be. Um, but I think that we need, we're we not in a position to make a recommendation about where it should be and how they should be handled. Any comments on this? I agree. Okay, yeah. anybody I else? No, I, okay. I, I'm comfortable with this crowd uh, consulting and recommending. Okay, all right, moving on to five. All right, I'm at the top of page nine. This is about accessing information about complaints. So this would require the council to consult with the ACLU and interested media associations in reviewing the public records request policy relating to allegations of officer misconduct and substantiations of those <clears throat> allegations in order to recommend any changes to current practice. So for example, it's in the council statute there is specific language about when the council can identify a law enforcement officer who has been um, alleged to have committed unprofessional conduct. And right now it's strictly written so that uh, the officer's identifying information is only made public um, once charges are filed. So this could be in regard to the council itself, or it could also be in regard to um, uh, allegations um, that an agency itself is aware of. Any comments? Julio has a comment and a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, so it, it, on line two <clears throat> and three, the public records request policy is the policy of the council or is that the statute? Um, I think that if this was, um, I, I think one, what I wanted to emphasize here was how does the council's policy um, interrelate with our public records request, our public records law and how do we mesh them and how do we make, um, and making some decisions around uh, how they interact. Well, well then I, th I would um, ask whether the committee thinks that the persons consulted would be broader than the ACLU and interested media associations. For example, <clears throat> the Human Rights Commission has, has confidentiality statutes, allegations of police misconduct are within its purview. If the officer misconduct relates to coworker conduct, such as sexual harassment, that would fall in our jurisdiction. Uh, subject to a confidentiality statute. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine that there are stakeholders relating to um, victims advocates um, that might be consulted as well. Those, those are the ones that come to mind, but um, if, if you're looking at the actual law, then there are two separate investigative entities I've identi identified that statutes and, and uh, the interplay of those statutes with what the council does. I think uh, in building with media and the ACLU would, would be a, probably a, a broader discussion. 
Yep. I think Betsy Ann. Maybe would you want to revise it to say um, so you could add the Human Rights Commission victims advocates, um, but maybe then re revise that to say in reviewing public access to records relating to allegations of law enforcement officer misconduct to make it more general. Well, I was just my reaction was why I wasn't I wasn't sure why the phrase other interested parties, which would also welcome community input since this is a community driven piece of legislation and um, would be um, would be helpful. And I think that would also avoid skirmishes about whether someone who has a blog is part of a media association or not. Right. I would just broaden it to that so that um, there would be, you know, there would be Vermonters of, of all sorts. But I think the HRC and certainly, and, and I think probably our office, you know, I think they would confer with us. We have a representative on the council, but I think that um, just mm -hmm. that it is a broader discussion, I think would probably be desirable. Yeah, and I think that the uh, term interested media associations was meant to be the Vermont Press Association and the Vermont Broadcasters Association as opposed to um, individual um, people who consider themselves media, they're not an association. But, but, but I think that that's a good idea to broaden it. I would support that. Okay. Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, sorry, yes, Chris, Chris Burkell from the council again. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in looking at all the changes in the proposed legislation, the one thing that I see is that there are there is a lot of action being requested um, of the council, which is now mm -hmm. being increased to an 18 member council, um, all of whom are essentially volunteering their time to do the best work that they can. And I'm, I'm just curious if there was any thought given to this um, section specifically to make um, the council advisory committee to consult with the ACLU and Interested Media Association um, almost as an, you know, they're an advisory committee. They're looking once established at um, law enforcement certification and recommendations for what type of action to be taken on someone's certification. Would it not be, would it not make sense for um, the council advisory committee to on public records information as well and suggest proposed changes to the council? Oh, that, I hadn't thought of that. That's an interesting, um, yeah. I have no problem with that. Anybody else? I'm just recognizing the, the actual work yeah. the council is responsible for and the fact that by statute now they're quarterly meetings and we meet monthly and you know we have an enormous amount of work right to still accomplish and we're piling more and more stuff on that now with new yeah. members and a larger group might be more difficult to accomplish. Or you, you will notice you will notice at the beginning of the fifth instance of amendment we did not say you had to have these done by a certain date but instead asked for progress report in january of 2021 knowing that some of these might be might go quickly because there are things that are already being worked on and they're and they might be more um administrative like reviewing the written exam and some of them are going to be much more time consuming and involve many more people. So I think we're we're giving you what Senator Collimore calls a gentle nudge to keep doing most of what you're already doing. Understood. I just I, I just wasn't yeah. sure if that had been considered at all of letting yep. that committee take a look at that. I'm okay with that. Other anybody else? Okay. Okay. All right. So body cams. 
Um, Madam Chair, this is Gwen Dakoff again from VLCT. I just wanted to make sure we included the language that I had, had flagged before about records retention. So beyond just public, re like not beyond just requests, but the retention periods for um, yep. those things. Okay, thank you. And thanks to Gwen for bringing that up because another note that I wrote down um, when she brought this up earlier is um, whether the Secretary of State should be involved here because it does involve the Public Records Act. Yep. Good. Um, so, oh, sorry. Okay, C, you ought to do C. I mean, um, B, six. Six. Yeah, and uh, just so just to confirm on that five and in regard to the access to complaint information, should the Secretary of State be added there because it does relate to public records or do you just want to yeah. apply that? Okay. No, I would add. Yeah. Okay. So number six is in regard to body cameras. The first thing is to require the LEAB to report any recommended changes it has to the policy on body cameras that it established pursuant to that 2016 act. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, after consulting with the ACLU and interested media associations, board would specifically recommend policies for responding to public records requests for body camera footage, including any recommended timelines to respond and how and what footage should be redacted. And then the language Gwen suggested is the length of retention. Um, and I think the storage goes to how, or wait, wait. Oh yeah, and, and storage, sorry, I can add storage. Yeah. And of central storage locations, you have on 16 and 17. Yeah. Well, that's, di that's different. First of all, this is about the uh, model, the um, policy. The record, right. Yes, right. So any comments on, on that? Leo has a comment. Okay. Uh, it's similar to the comment on the preceding uh, sections, which has to do okay. with the breadth of the folks who are entitled to be or to offer their their uh, input during consultation. So I don't have in front of me the law that establishes the members of the law enforcement advisory board, but I think it's probably not broad enough to encompass a lot of the communities that are interested in body-worn camera policies. So um, something similar to the interested parties might, might be de desirable. Uh, yep. Release of footage affects not only media interests or civil li libertarian interests, but I think broader community interests. So add the same kind of players in that one. Okay. Good idea. Robert has. Okay, I'm sorry, Robert. Yeah, I just said. Robert? Oh, okay. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at lines 12 to 15 regarding uh, redaction, etc. Um, you're probably aware of this Doyle versus City of Burlington case. It 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 basically, um, without reading it in the last couple of months, it says that the department uh, cannot charge the individual requester the time it took to redact and redacting uh, a body cam on the street is a big deal in terms of fuzzing out faces, et cetera. I think this is a major issue. Um, I would suggest you put some kind of deadline, some sort of report back, uh, something that makes sure that this doesn't get dropped. And I don't know if I've not been following the activities of the body in recent years. I don't know if there's a bill to address Doyle. Um, Commissioner Sherling might know or the sheriff might know. I, I don't. But it, it's, it's, you know, what you're seeing nationwide, um, increased use of body camera footage, increased use of iPhone cameras. In terms of transparency, it's a great tool. 
the question then becomes, how do you make that relevant to holding officers to account if they're stepping out of line? So I wouldn't, I, th I think it requires some more attention and, and a turnaround date. My other comment is um, interested media association. I followed you back and forth with Julio on this. Turns out the, that Vermont Digger would not, is not a member of either association because they're not broadcast nor print. So I agree, you got it. I suggest you be broader in who's to consult with us. Um, right. Again, this is to me a very major issue that we're going to face with increasing frequency uh, and cries out for, in my view, some legislative re response. What it is at this point in time, I can't say, but I think you want to cycle back to it. It's a suggestion. And do you, Robert, well, I do you think date? Do you have a a, 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 reason, a a date that you would consider they could do this work in or Julio? Do you have a time frame that? I, I would say a year, you know, come, well, let's see, you, you come back in January. It's not much time given what everybody has on their plate in regard to COVID. Um, perhaps September of 2021. I don't know. September, uh, well, that's, you, you want to, yeah, I'd want it before your next session. I actually think that there's going to be some um, uh, urgency to probably do this because we have in the bill this morning in the Senate, we said they couldn't have any grants or uh, unless they complied with this policy. And we just decided they also could not send recruits to the right. academy if they didn't by January of 2022. So I think that there's going to be um, some urgency on the part of all those people to get this figured out quickly. Right. And I, I admit to not being familiar with the body model body warm camera policy, nor, nor act the 2016 Act. I, I just know it's a big issue um, in, in in the field. So, an appropriate date might be the fall, uh, a year from this fall, for, uh, fall of 21. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, you can't you can't do it this session. You can't have it ready for next session. It's too short. So I think you got to put it out till you convene in um, 2022. He said, sadly. So they would have to bring recommendations for legislative changes and to um, by January of 2022. And then that is also when they um, won't be able to get um, grants or send to the Academy. Unless they yeah, comply. Again, I'm, I'm not, I'm, uninformed with regard to the existing policy. So maybe no, that isn't an is existing policy. Sorry, that isn't an existing policy. We just we just put that in our amendments. Yeah, Michael, Michael Sherling suggested more urgency in bringing it up to January 22 that uh, contingency uh, recruits and- uh, No, I understand that. I'm sorry, I shouldn't yeah. interrupt. So September, though, are you want Don't we need it before January to 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 draft some legislation about Jeanette? It, 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 yes, but it, it is a major it, issue out there that's unresolved. I'll say that yeah. the court was pretty clear that it can't be charged back to the requester, but it didn't say a whole lot more. This was an ACLU case, so, and I'm not like I said, I've not read it in a while. I didn't see this till today. I'm not woefully unprepared to be expert on this. I'm just flagging it. So. Uh, I um, I mean, we could put a deadline on here. We also are asking them to come back in January 21 with a progress report on all of these. And if they come back with a progress report that says, well, we really haven't done anything, then we can do something. Well, you might want to put it in your punch list for that progress report. In our what? Your punch list, your list of topics for which there it is. That's what this is. Okay. Okay. This is the punch list for the progress reports. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. And, Allison. Uh, January. Okay, I got you. Thank you. I'm back to page six. Thank you. 
Anybody else have comments on this section? Julio has just- But I think that, go ahead, Julio. Um, so to get, I, I don't have uh, any recommendation about the timing I, and I'm not a public records expert. I'm, pr I'm fairly well ac acquainted with body worn camera policy in other places. Right now, as of today, I think there are 20, almost two dozen states and DC have laws governing public records requests for body worn or in car video. And there are many issues that come up, including uh, acts of violence that are captured on video that are not committed by police officers, people getting killed, captured on video, sexual assault, uh, communications with undercover uh, officers or informants, um, medical or, or psychological treatment that's provided in the field. Uh, so it it is very complicated and um, a lot of people are gonna have to do a lot of research. The other unknown for the committee is that probably all of the remaining states have, have bills or are working on bills to manage and or regulate body-worn video. Uh, and there's also federal legislation that uh, is either in play this summer or later in the fall. So I, I, that's a long way of giving a little bit more detail to Robert's point, which is that it's a big issue. It's very complicated. And the good news is that we have a lot to learn from. We have a lot of other experience that we can draw from. Um, but I guess if you want to say the bad news is that those laws demonstrate that there are lots of really nuanced decisions that need to be made. That's it. So committee, are we okay just leaving it like this with a progress report in January or do we want to um, put more? I mean, we certainly can't make it before January. Okay, that was an up, Brian? I say just leave it as is managing. With the, except adding those um, other players. Anthony? Yeah. Yes, I agree with Brian. Allison? Yeah. If we're actively going to, for whoever follows us in GovOps for next year, whoever's there, that I just want to make sure it's the, that this is on the punch list because all of these things need action sooner rather than later. So, I mean, I would tend to put a date in. Well, we can't. I, yeah. But... We can't, we are asking for a report, progress report back on all of these in January for whoever happens to be there. And we can't tell them what they should take up or what they shouldn't take up, whoever right. is on GovOps next year. But just, my guess is the advocates and those interested parties will do a fairly good job of reminding them that this is something they have to address. Let's hope. I have no doubt in my mind that the ACLU, the Human Rights Commission, the Attorney General's Office, the VLCT, the media, and the Secretary of State will not be out there um, pushing for resolution. Right, I agree. The top of her body with the All right, so now we come then to um, B, lines yep. 14 through 18. Yeah, so this would require DPS to consult with the LEAB to investigate the possibility of a statewide group purchasing contract for body cameras and central storage locations. And if the department is going to recommend such a group, it would need to detail its recommended structure and operation. And to be honest with you, I just made this up because because it seemed to me that one of the big issues that we heard from local people around the use of body cameras was the cost and the storage cost and all of that. So this does not presume that anything like this could even happen, but I know um, if you buy tires in bulk, if you have central buying for tires, you save money. So I don't know, but I just made it up. Well, if we had an, agency of public 
safety, we, we could ask them to do this for all agencies and make it available. I, I think it makes total sense to do this kind of a purchase that we know more and more public safety offices are gonna be using and purchasing. It makes as much sense as possible to make it affordable, as affordable as possible, and to create uh, consistency uh, across the state. So I, I, I actually Mark. think it's a good idea. Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, one thing to note that there are agencies, when we talk about uh, a mass purchasing, um, I love the idea. Uh, we have had our body cameras for several years now. They've been an mm -hmm. uh, integral tool, uh, not only for investigations, but also for accountability when somebody files a complaint against one of our deputies. The concern I have, uh, so we found a, a way uh, in-house to store our, uh, our current footage. The concern I would have is having to import anything if there were a centralized use into a new system, as opposed to maintain a legacy system that we ultimately get rid of over time. Um, so that's one concern. The second concern I have is if it were a centralized thing, uh, agencies that currently have body worn cameras, do they need to get rid of the cameras they currently have that might integrate with their in-car camera systems as well as other systems that they have? So in the long term, this is a, a really good uh, goal. Uh, I think that it will do a lot, but there are going to also be pieces which should be part of this, uh, this study if we determine the transitional costs as well as the long-term costs. Um, the uh, the second thing to note is that one of the uh, I won't name but one of the most uh, well-known systems is also one of the most expensive, which is funding. Then it also makes it very difficult uh, for a small agency to try and say, well, we're going to have body cameras as part of the state uh, state uh, purchasing contract, but we can't afford it. So. Uh, the consideration of how it's funded, if it's a centralized authority, needs to be at the state level. It can't be pushed on a police department of two people. Uh, the cost could be exorbitant. Oh, I don't think that this, this actually doesn't do anything. It just asks them to look into the possibility. And if there is a possibility, they would have to come back to us for recommendations of how and any transitional um, issues or anything. But I wasn't, I, I hope I wasn't um, misconstruing this to say that I think this is causing change itself. I understand it's for a report, but I wanted the committee to be aware of those things. Yep. Yep. Any other comments on this one? Nope. All right. Number seven. Last one. Um, LEAB would recommend a statewide policy on officers' use of military equipment. So I, I, Madam, I have a concern. The LEAB is pretty much all L law enforcement officers, right? I mean, it's pretty heavily mm -hmm. law enforcement. I, I guess I have a concern here that that a citizen that citizen voice should be heard in this uh, recommendation as well, because I, uh, I I see incremental use, uh, increased incremental use of, of, of military equipment being purchased by uh, a, a range of agencies. I know, I, I think Commissioner Sherling said that it was mostly the state police, but I, it's discussed, I've heard our police chief discuss it, so it's available. I mean, it's, I think it's more broadly available uh, for, for local agencies to consider purchasing as well. And I, 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 I guess I'd like to have more citizen voices in this in this discussion because it's a major citizen concern, the militarization of our police. We have state exception. Brian? I guess I would ask what exactly are we referring to when we talk about military equipment? Are we talking about protective equipment? I would support that. What do you yeah, I, I think I, that what we're talking about here is Go ahead, Brian. Well, I just, I'm asking the question, I guess, um, what exactly is military equipment? Well, that's the problem we don't know. I mean, and the most extreme elements, people will tell you that you're going to get tanks and, you know, armored cars and things of that sort. On the other end of the spectrum, people would say, well, it could be flashlights, could be any, oh, running, out of, running out of battery here. 
could be flashlights. So it's a whole range of things and we don't know. So that, that's part of the dilemma. I think that one of the reasons for putting this in here is that what we heard from the commissioner was that currently the um, department approves all um, requests for military equipment by local boards. But I don't know that they have any kind of a uniform policy around how, what um, requests they approve and which ones they don't and what kinds of equipment they would approve and what they wouldn't approve. So what this is doing is asking them to come up with some kind of a, a policy that would say, um, would give some um, guidance to local agencies when they're applying for it. And we did hear that there are two armored cars in Vermont, there are no helicopters, and almost all of the equipment is protective gear, personal protective gear, or um, communications office, equipment. And office equipment. But, well, yeah. And Mark, Mark, so, Mark had his hand up. Yes, I saw him. I was just um, waiting. Mark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, to Senator Clarkson's point, I think it would be valuable to have community input because uh, on one end, it's 100% absolutely a, a community issue. Uh, people care about it. Uh, on the other end, uh, and this is where uh, I wish the commissioner could be here for this, um, the, it's known as the 1033 program. If you haven't heard it uh, called that, that's the federal mm -hmm. program. Uh, there's a lot of rules that go with it. How it works is far beyond my knowledge. I just know that it's not a simple, uh, a simple program. It's a federal government system. Uh, so there are <laughs> some parts where people will say, well, we disagree and we could agree uh, similar to unemployment that we also disagree, but the federal government it has to be that way and that's how it is. Uh, so uh, I think that there needs to be a level of control for the Department of Public Safety or whoever is uh, managing that program to ensure we stay within the federal guidelines. I also know that uh, there's one agency that has a military issued lawnmower, uh, a military issued snowblower. Uh, so there's a lot of things that it provides. Um, at one point I was looking on the, the site, um, which has a variety of things. We have um, two M14s that were used for parades. We don't issue them to officers, but they're considered an offensive weapon, but they're pretty guns and the military has those as part of color guards. We haven't used them in our agency in a few years, but uh, it's part of traditions uh, in protecting the flag. And uh, so just considering what is an offensive weapon versus a, a parade weapon uh, is also a piece here uh, that needs to be considered. Uh, there's a variety of equipment and I think it's also uh, necessary that people understand that this is not just uh, equipping people with uh, things to, to hurt other people, but it's also things that are uh, essentially sitting in a, a park uh, or a parking lot or in a warehouse that is saving the taxpayer money by me not having to buy a lawnmower or a snowblower or some other useful piece of equipment that the military simply So could, it, could we here add the Law Enforcement Advisory Board after community public involvement or input recommend a statewide policy? I, I like that, make it more about a community forum that's hosted by the LEAB. Uh, yeah, if they're yeah. I, I would support that. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and it might be different. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, we're always trying to say how we should let our individual municipalities decide for themselves. I think this might be one of those situations where we should, but I know I'm the lone voice here on that. So I, I guess I don't have as much of an aversion to military equipment as, as some of the other members. I, I think the public really has an aversion to the militarization of the police. And I think it's one of the issues that we're hearing now uh, I mean, correct me if I'm I'm wrong, but that's certainly one of the issues that I, I've I've heard, and uh, I think as much as possible, we we should be able to include them uh, on this. I'm happy having the community involvement, and I think the LEA board will do that as a matter of um, 
I mean, we're asking them to do that. I think that a lot of the outcry right now that we're hearing from people is a misunderstanding of what it even means to have military surplus equipment. Um, I, I think that if you ask the person on the street that has, um, and believe me, I, there are a lot of people in my community who are very much against getting, having per, um, military surplus equipment. But if you ask them, should we ha get a lawnmower so that we don't have to buy a lawnmower, they would say, well, sure, of course. So I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what's meant by it and that there are, a, there are uh, agencies around the country that are using much more so than here in Vermont that are using um, the kind of offensive um, military equipment that the sheriff was referring to. So I think that part of it is a misunderstanding of people um, about what it is we're even talking about. So then hopefully this involvement will help dispel some of that. Right. Yes, that's right. Okay, committee, we've gone through the entire set of amendments. Are there any comments from anybody right now about, I think that the um, our next step would be to um, have Betsy Ann make the changes that um, were recommended today to bring it to us tomorrow. Is that possible, Betsy Ann? Okay. And then to um, do a final review and a vote. Are we there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we'll invite the same uh, group of people back tomorrow. And tomorrow it will be after the floor, whatever on earth that means, right? Well, and it may be no, before the floor because we, we be meeting after we meet as a committee. Yeah, I, um, I we're meeting on the floor from twelve to one or one thirty. So let's set this up for one thirty tomorrow, and then um, we will probably be going back onto the floor after we're done. And the other thing we'll do is. Um, uh, so could somebody text Chris Bray and ask him if he can just pop in for one second to vote on the charter so that we can yes, get those I've done? Been, I've been texting with him, so I will ask okay. him to pop in. He said, he said to just let him know when we were ready for a vote and he would pop in. Yes, I will. Voting now. Then we can get the charters on the agenda and get them Voting taken care now, of. Voting now, please join. For less than five minutes for five minutes i'm not gonna over promise <laughs> okay done okay so let's wait for a minute here for him to um join us and mm -hmm. then the other thing that mm -hmm. we need to look at is the um and i will send out the the stephanie um, barrett has done a uh, an Excel worksheet or whatever that's called around the um, COVID money, the, the budgetary issues. And we'll look at the ones that were um, within our jurisdiction. And we can do that um, tomorrow afternoon also. Great. So the charters that um, we're looking at are Elmore and what's the- uh, uh, St. Albans City. That's right, Elmore and St. Albans. Brian, is your fan still going? Yes, if I leave it up, you can hear it probably. I have mine on too, but I don't have it on too high or else I can't hear anything. Yeah, that, that, that's a challenge. This room is just here. I, I feel like maybe Chris is coming. Madam Chair. 
Yes. Are you uh, done with S124 for now? <gasps> Thank you very much. I believe we are. Okay, I'm gonna head out. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Yeah. Fun. Do you need me for anything? For putting else? all those vague ideas into real words. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I just want to say that the two of you just really did a great job taking a lot of what we talked about, and we had a wide palette of things that we discussed. Thank you for giving them form. You really, you you did a great job. That was Senator White. I I know Sunday. She does her some of her best work on Sunday. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks finish. a lot. Thanks, Betsy Ann. All right. Take care. Bye. Yep. Well, um, um, I don't see him yet. Sorry, I did text him. I'll try calling him. Always useful when I call. He might be in the pro tem's office. Oh, I uh, mean, he was, but I. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I thought, oh, you, you can just call the number there. I, it just means I'll have done both. At least I'll have. Mm. Okay. Well, I texted him and I couldn't be more direct. Voting now. Please join for five minutes. So um, we could leave the vote open. Well, then some of us have to stick around. Uh, might I, okay. Um, what I might suggest is that- um, It could be 4-1, it, it, it's okay yeah. to be 4 zero, one. Yeah, it could be. Because this is, I mean, these aren't controversial issues that we need a lot of support on anyway. They didn't right, seem to be. Just, huh? They did not seem to be known. Yeah. Let's just vote on them. Yeah, I would boldly propose. I don't have their numbers in front of me, or I'd make a motion. Um, does any, I, was, I should. Brian, do you have them in front of you? No, uh, no, they were on the committee page, though. Um, yeah. Hang on, hang on. I've got my notes. I can't even remember what day. We talked about them on Friday, is that right? Or no, yes, we did. We talked about them Yes, Friday. you did them on Friday. Because Jeanette wasn't with us, as I right. recall. So here... Um, okay. Uh, yes, it's H9946 for Elmore. And 943. H946, yeah. I have. Is that not right? And yeah, it's H9, H9, that's 943 is St. Albans. Right. Yep. We didn't have St. Albans. Right. Okay, so. Go ahead and uh, move, Allison, if you want to make the motion. Yeah, I, um, I would move that we uh, uh, favorably vote uh, H946 out favorably. Here, here. <gasps> and there's Senator Bray. I, there's I, I said hello when I got here, but. God, hey, you did very well. I just. Are you out of breath from running? No. No, my hair is on fire. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. yeah. We can see you've lost a considerable amount of hair. We can smell it all the way in wood to Woodstock. Yeah, I'm I'm living dog years. Like by the end of this year, I'll be seven years older. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, so I just made the motion to uh, to vote at H four ninety. 946, the uh, Charter of Elmore out favorably. So, uh, I, uh, uh, Bray. Yes. Clarkson. Yes. Uh, oh, Collimore. Yes. Polina. Sure. And White. Yes. Great. Thank you. Brian, do you want to report? 
Brian, do you want to report? Yeah, I'll or do both of them if you if you'd like, Madam Chair. He he was very gracious and agreed oh. to do that Friday, actually. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. It was really kind of him. Uh, and then I would move that we vote uh, H 943 out favorably, which is the charter to the city of uh, St. Albans. And I would start again, Senator Bray. Enthusiastically votes yes. Yes, <laughs> Senator Clarkson, yippee. Yes, and Senator Colmore. Yes. Senator Polina. Yes. And Senator White. Yes. Great. Both motions carry 5-0. All right. And you have received permission for both of these, Madam Chair? Okay. Yes. So I'll let John Bloomer know. Actually, I can let him know right now, I guess. That would be great. And, uh, maybe we can get him on the notice oh. comments. So, uh, Senator Bray, just for your information, we took a lot of, uh, we have an amendment to 124. And yeah. Betsy Ann is making some suggested changes that we had today, and we plan to vote on it tomorrow. Great, thank you. And then offer it before third reading, which Tim was hoping we could do on Thursday. And I wasn't sure because I didn't know how long this dealing with these amendments would take, but it went much faster than I had anticipated. Good. So. Well, it was well organized and we just went boom, boom, boom. And you're gonna love them, Chris Bray. So when you see Betsy Ann's email, she'll have an update for you. Thank you very much. Okay, and committee, is there anything else we need to, to do? I will forward that. Um, uh, if Stephanie didn't forward it to everybody, I'll forward the um, Stephanie Barrett's um, breakdown of the budget so that we can look at the, uh, um, areas that are within our jurisdiction and um, comment on them to the Appropriations Committee. Is there anything else we need to do today? Gail? Yeah, how would you phrase that for the agenda for tomorrow? Um, review of budgetary items. Thank you. Uh, CRF, maybe qualify it. No, I would just say budgetary items because I don't think it's all necessarily CRF, but I'm not sure, so. Because the budget's gone. I mean, the first quarter budget we've sent on its way. Right. It so is the CRF, but with, it's we're only dealing with CRF money, I think. That's true. Okay. Yeah. But I have, I have a question, which is not totally related to that. But what happened to the Pay Act? Yes, and where is it? Well, what they I thought it was going to be in the budget. The, what they're doing the with the Pay Act is they're funding the entire. They're funding the first year. And then the second year will be dealt with when we come back. But there's so not going to be a vote taken on it. Yeah, it's um, it's in the it's um, going to be presented. Appropriations is presenting it. I don't know when it was on the list that the chairs looked at this morning. Okay. From what I understand, Ryan. Anthony, it's going to be the topic of the All Senate Caucus tomorrow morning at eight. Oh, okay. At least one of the topics. Okay, I was just curious. It seemed like we were there was working on it, and all of a sudden it just disappeared. So we have well, an they all didn't... what? We have an All Senate Caucus at eight. Yeah, don't be late. Yeah, oh no, I, we we had. Senate Economic Development for 8.30. So I, 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 it's news to me. I mean, we've been on the floor or eating lunch or meeting here. I haven't had a time to look at emails. We got an email from Vanessa a little while ago. Okay. I hadn't seen that either. Thank you, Jeanette. Oh, I'm so glad somebody else doesn't multitask. <laughs> I wish I could multitask, but I can't. I actually did a no-no today. When we were on the floor, I sent a note during a vote. 8 a.m. In, in, okay. in the Zoom sidebar? No, on, a, on an email. If you, if you send anything out on the Zoom chat thing, it goes to YouTube. Everybody sees it in the world. Yeah. Well, so you're confessing now, but it, it may have been <laughs> entirely invisible, so. It was. 
Yeah. But now the Senate secretary is getting in his car and starting to drive to your home right now. <laughs> to slap me and tell me to pay attention to the rules. Okay. Um, is there anything else we need to do today? No, we did good work today. We did.